Nahum chapter 3. Nahum chapter 3. Thank you for joining me there. This is the last of the three chapters in this book, this counterbalance to the book of Jonah. Shall we begin? World War II is considered to be the bloodiest and the biggest war in all of human history. Tens of millions of human beings, tens of millions of human beings, most of them civilians, perished. 50 million people, or maybe far more, died in a span of just about six years. World War II is often said to have started on September 1st, 1939. When Nazi Germany, following the leadership of Adolf Hitler, invaded Poland. Adolf Hitler was like a king set on conquest. He wanted to invade the lands surrounding Germany and expand the borders of his kingdom. He was ready to attack Germany's neighbors and to destroy Germany's enemies. He and those who followed him were aggressive and cruel. The Nazis murdered so many. They had death squads, mobile killing units called Einsatzgruppen. The Nazis would not hesitate to empty a town or some other place of its Jewish people and then murder them. Sometimes the victims were forced to dig their own graves. Sometimes the victims were forced to undress themselves and put their shoes and their clothes into separate piles before they were shot to death. Over 10,000 could be killed in just one day. These Einsatzgruppen, these Nazi death squads, filled mass graves with murdered civilians. These murders were sometimes meticulously documented. One such report is called the Jaeger Report. This report, filed by a Nazi commander named Karl Jaeger, shows that the number of people put to death by just one death squad in a five-month period was 137,346 people. So, following five plus years of such bloodthirsty behavior, of such mass executions, not to mention the concentration camps, I'm sure that we can all imagine <laughs> that the fall of the Fuhrer, the Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler, and his Nazi German kingdom, with the city of Berlin as its capital, that the end of that kingdom must have been, must have been a great relief to all who had felt their cruelty, who had endured their terror and yet somehow survived. And let us recall the fall of the Fuhrer. At noon on April 30th, 1945, Hitler was in the city of Berlin. He and others were hunkered down in the bunker. At noon, Hitler was informed that the Russians were only a block away. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Hitler ate his last meal, and at 3.30, he was found dead. Nazi Germany's king was dead. Nazi Germany's capital was crushed, and that kingdom was, had collapsed. Ruin and rubble, that is what was left. About a week later, on Monday, May 7th, 1945, the remaining Nazi leadership signed an unconditional surrender document. And Winston Churchill said that the downfall of Nazi Germany, as seen in this unconditional surrender, was, quote, the signal for the greatest outburst of joy in the history of mankind. When Germany finally surrendered, Winston Churchill said, that 
was the signal for the greatest outburst of joy in the history of humanity. Huge crowds of relieved and happy people filled the streets of London, Paris, New York, and Moscow. One historian has written, for Jews and others who had been targeted by Nazis, a great sense of relief was felt at, a, at outlasting Hitler. One woman who survived the final solution, that was the Nazis' plan to exterminate all Jews, one woman who survived that said, quote, During the five terrible war years, we could not indulge in simple pleasures that life offers to normal people. All of our efforts were directed towards fighting the enemy and surviving. Now, for the first time since September 1st, 1939, we could unwind and be normal again. To walk the streets without hearing the hated HALT! Without the fear of being rounded up by Germans and pushed into military trucks. This survivor said, No more ghettos. No more starvation. Typhus, gas chambers, Einsatzgruppen. The intense fear and persecution were over. What happened in Europe in 1945, the utter ruin of the Nazi regime, is a modern era historical illustration of an ancient historical event. What happened in Europe in 1945 illustrates for us what happened in Assyria in 612 BC. The Nazis deserved to die. The destruction of Nazi Germany was completely deserved. It was fitting for it to end in ruins. And it was good news, good news, for those who had suffered at the merciless hands of the Nazis. It was a cause for celebration. It brought indescribable relief. It put tears of joy in people's eyes. It put smiles on people's faces. Even concentration camp victims, if they had the strength, were smiling. No doubt, no doubt, <laughs> there were people who clapped their hands. They clapped their hands for joy. They did. When they heard about it, when they heard the ruin, heard of the ruin of the Nazi regime, and the same was true when it came to the ruin of Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. News of Nineveh's destruction was happy news. Good news. Good news for Nineveh's neighbors. It was a relief. It was a cause of celebration for tears of joy, for smiling faces, and yes, for clapping hands. That, that's what the third and final chapter of this book of Nahum is about. Nahum chapter 3 begins, of course, with verse 1, and it says, Woe to the bloody city, Ir Damim, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. Their city was saturated with sin, saturated with sin. We read of lies and plunder and prey, and the city is labeled as a city of bloods, plural, the bloody city. The Assyrians had a long, well-known history of victimizing their neighbors in various ways. And when, they, and when Nineveh is described as the bloody city, it probably points out the fact that the Assyrians were guilty of many unauthorized killings. What is murder? What is murder? Murder is unauthorized killing, and Nineveh had been guilty of such killings, unauthorized killings, for decades. It's well documented, it's well known. It certainly was for their neighbors, their victims. They were guilty of so much unnecessary, unwarranted shedding, spilling of people's bloods, blood. The plundering was also mentioned back in chapter 2, verse 2. The 
Pray is also described at the end of chapter 2, verse 12. It's a sin-saturated city. It's been that way for a long, long time. Secondly, in verses 2 and 3, we see that their punishment fits the crime. The prescribed punishment fits the crime. God is not unjust. It says in verses 2 and 3, the crack of the whip, rumble of the wheel, galloping horse, bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword, glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. You see, the Assyrians had been piling up bodies for a long, long time. They've been piling up corpses for decades, not to mention the piling up of decapitated heads or the hanging up of decapitated heads. This was their history. One, one of the kings bragged about taking the flesh of their enemies and feeding them to dogs, pigs, vultures, and others. They would skin their enemies. They would do all kinds of things with their victims. But now, now Nineveh is put on notice that their own dead bodies will fill their own capital city. And the punishment fits the crime. I read that many unburied skeletons were found by archaeologists as they dug into what remains of Nineveh. In verse 4, we have their past pictured as the past of a prostitute. Their past is pictured that way. Verse 4, and why, why? All for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and deadly, are her charms who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. So, Nineveh's crimes are further described by way of a metaphor. Real-life prostitutes are deceptive. Why is that? Why is the industry of prostitution deceptive? Because they advertise pleasure and they deliver death. And what's true of the prostitution industry is also true of the porn industry. They advertise pleasure, but you can know this for certain, they will deliver you death. When we were in Florida, we avoided the tolls as much as we could using the GPS. You know, you can click the box, avoid tolls. And when you avoid the tolls, you end up going through lots of different places that maybe most tourists don't go through. And I saw lots of establishments offering pleasure. And in my mind, I put labels on all those signs that said, death, death, death. You want to sell me something, you think it's gonna, you're telling me it's going to bring me pleasure. I know what it will bring me. It will bring me death. So says Proverbs chapter 7 and other passages in God's word. The pleasure is what's presented. That's what makes the advertisement. But that pleasure, it won't last. And some of you know this all too well. Unfortunately, you've gone down that road. Oh, not with prostitutes, probably. But you know that in the end, there's death, there's shame, there's darkness when you dabble in sexual sin, isn't there? We could stand up and tell stories, couldn't we? And this city is pictured as having a past like that. I would just remind you, I would just remind you and remind myself, as one of my mentors said, our enemy points at less, and what does he do? He promises us that it is more. And when we listen to him, he has got us. 
started back in the garden, and he's been doing it ever since. Number four, we see again that their crime is fitting, their punishment is fitting their crime. Their punishment is is appropriate for their crime. We see this in verses five through seven. These pay, these words. They, they almost jump off the page and grab your soul, don't they? Is this God talking? He's saying it a second time in this short little book. Behold, I am against you. We've already heard him say that at the end of chapter 2. Says it again. Those words should grab your soul, sober us up. Shake us back to reality of who God really is. Declares the Lord of hosts and will lift up your skirts over your face. This is metaphor, remember. This is a picture. And I will make nations look at your nakedness. He says, I'm going to publicly disgrace you. That's what he's communicating. I'm going to publicly humiliate you. I am going to make a public spectacle of you. That's the real thing that would happen sometimes to prostitutes. He's using the metaphor of prostitution and now the metaphor of the punishment for prostitution to let them know, here's what you are going to face at my hands. This is God talking. Yep, that's God talking. Kingdoms at your shame. Verse 6, I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? They will be publicly disgraced and it is what they deserve. You and I never need to worry. We never need to worry about this. That God is going to do something unjust to his enemies. Never got to worry about that. Never got to worry that God's going to go too far. Be too heavy. He's going to be heavy handed. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to punish them too much. Never got to worry about that. His punishment, his, his wrath always comes again. At the right time, in the right measure, against the right recipients. This is what they deserve. See also Revelation 16. Fifth, we find that their future, interestingly, is compared with the Egyptian city of Thebes. Thebes. We find this in verses 8 through 11. Are you better than Thebes? Let's, let's, let's compare cities. Are you better than Thebes? That sat by the Nile? That's another city that lay along a river. Water around her, her rampart of sea, water her wa wall, well fortified, good defenses. Got, got allies in the region. Cush was her strength, Egypt too. And that without limit, Put and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet what happened to Thebes? Tell me again, what, what happened to Thebes? She became an exile. She went into captivity. This is speaking of a city. And yes, her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. Who did that? Who took babies and dashed them in pieces? You know who did that? Who conquered Thebes back in 663? Who did that? You know who did that? The Assyrians, that's right. The Assyrians with King Ashurbanipal leading the way. Four honored men were, lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also, you also, remember what happened in Thebes? You also will be drunken. Again, this is metaphor. This is metaphor. You will go into hiding. 
you will seek a refuge from the enemy. 663, the Assyrians came to that strong city in southern, that is upper, I know, it's confusing, southern Egypt, located along the Nile River. They had fortifications, but Thebes had fallen. They had friends, allies in the area, but Thebes had fallen. And it was a violent and devastating fall. By the way, I find it interesting that the same Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, was reported to have put a dog chain, a dog chain through the jaw of a king whom he, defe whom he defeated, and then he placed that king in a dog kennel. That, that's who we're dealing with. That's who we're dealing with. That's who this is written against. The Lord lets Nineveh know a city, a great city, a strong city located along a different river, that is the Tigris. He lets them know that their fate will be similar to the fate of Thebes. And about 550 years later, excuse me, not 500, about 50, if I can do math, 663 minus 612. About 50 years later, that's exactly what happened. Don't ask me to do your math homework for you. All right, number six, their, def their defenses, easy to overcome. Easy to overcome, verses 12 through 13. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe fruits. I don't know a lot about figs or fig trees, but I guess if you give a good shake to a fig tree with first ripe fruits, the figs just drop in your mouth. Easy pickings. Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has devoured your bars. Their fortresses, their warriors, their gates, and the bars of their gates, that's what the bars are about, the bars of their gates, would not be strong enough to resist the invading forces when they arrived. Now the ladies in the room, my, my female listeners in the room, when it says, behold, your troops are women in your midst, that is not a slam against women. <laughs> we can just acknowledge that generally... Women are physically weaker than men. And historically, it's men who go to combat. Historically, we don't send women to the front lines. Historically, it's men who serve in combat. And generally speaking, women are physically weaker than men. So please don't be offended by verse 13, ladies. He's saying, you're, you're going to be overcome you're going to be easy pickings for the enemy when he shows up at your door. Number seven, their resistance, futile, futile against the fire and the sword. We've got, we've got more picturesque language here. The fire and the sword are personified in these verses, verses 14 through 18. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts. Do what you can. Go into the clay. Tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mold. Try to fortify yourself. Fortify your city. There will the fire devour you. Consume you. And the sword will cut you off. It will consume you. It will devour you like the locust. Multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like... The grasshopper, you increase your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spreads its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers, your scribes like clouds of locusts settling on the fences in a day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. Your shepherds are asleep. This may be a reference to the, to the other leaders of Assyria below the king of Assyria. They're asleep. What kind of sleep is that? Maybe that's a reference to death. 
Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. Notice in verse 18, the king of Assyria is directly addressed, isn't he? And so putting it all together, this book, Nahum, is not just addressed to a city, it's also addressed to a people and to the leader of that people, the king of Assyria. Fire and swords, back in the 7th century, the 600s BC, those were common weapons. The fire and the sword are personified as consuming the city and its citizens. And archaeologists, as I've already said, they have, they have discovered unburied, many unburied skeletons and evidence of fire in that city. Many people were slaughtered or scattered, and the city was burned when it was conquered in 612 B.C., just as God said. Lastly, their wound, fatal. Fatal. No possibility of recovery. They're not going to make a comeback after this. Once Nineveh is conquered, the Assyrian Empire collapses. No comeback for this kingdom. I really much prefer the way that your NIV reads. Those of you carrying the NIV, nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For reasons stated, who has not felt your endless cruelty? That sounds like something that a Holocaust survivor could say, don't you think? Someone who lived through the reign of terror of Adolf Hitler and his mobile killing squad, somebody who suffered in a concentration camp, endless cruelty. That's what we felt. That's what we've suffered. My Bible says there's no easing your hurt. You won't recover from this. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. Joyful clapping. Joyful clapping of the hands will be heard from those who have suffered at the cruel hands of the Assyrians. Those who have felt the Assyrians' cruelty, they are going to be filled with relief, filled with joy. Tears in the eyes, smiles on the faces, the clapping of the hands. What, the, what did you say? What was that? Nineveh has been conquered? Assyria has collapsed? What was that? Oh, praise God. Praise the Lord. Remember what we read at the end of chapter 1? Remember that? Chapter 1? Clapping going on in Judah. Clapping's hurt being heard in Judah once the news of Nineveh's downfall gets across the mountains and, and, and is heard in the city of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. Chapter 1, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news. Here comes the messenger! And he's carrying good news. He's publishing peace. What's the good news? Nineveh is in ruins. Assyria's kingdom has collapsed. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. <sighs> Assyria's unceasing evil was finally stopped by the sovereign God who was against them. Yes, I know... I know that it was Babylonians and Medes and whoever else, coalition forces that came. But God was ultimately behind those forces. God is sovereign. God is sovereign over global affairs. Their unceasing evil ultimately was stopped by the God who is always in control. You know, if you have been a neighbor of Nineveh, if you've been living in Jerusalem or some other part of that little holdout 
kingdom of Judah, you know, that island swimming in a sea of Assyrian oppression. If you've been one of those people, one of those who had felt the cruelty of the Assyrians, it would, I think it would be extremely easy to start wondering, to start thinking that God is, he's distant. He's, he's really not interested in what's going on here. It would be easy to start thinking that he's unaware or unconcerned. Or maybe he's just unable to do anything. Poor God, can't get it together. Can't find the resources to come to our rescue, I guess. He knows what's happening, you know, he cares, he's got sympathy for us, but I guess, I guess, just doesn't, doesn't have the power to get it done. It'd be easy to think that way, wouldn't it? As the days and the weeks and the months and the years and the decades tick by, I guess God doesn't know or doesn't care or is just not able to help us out. But that was never true. And it's not true when it comes to what you're going through, is it? If you're here today and you're feeling like, I'm, you know, I'm really not sure God really understands what I'm suffering. I, or maybe he really doesn't care that much. Or, you know, he's a sympathetic friend, but he really can't help me out. It's not true. It's never been true. Well, as we come to the end of this short book, don't close your Bible yet, okay? Don't close your Bible. I know the notes are all completed. And, and you can see the pastor's landing the plane. But please don't close your Bible yet, because we're not quite done. Because we don't want to just study the Bible and say, Wow, look at that! I have learned more! I, I have stuffed more data into my Nahum file in my mental file cabinet. Let's pray. No, no, we got to say even more. So what, what does this have to do with us? So what? <laughs> we're not living in Judah. We're not, we're not neighbors of Nineveh. What does this say to us? What does God, what does God want us to take home with us? What's our takeaway? How's the Holy Spirit working here? Well, I think one thing that we can all agree on, one thing that we should all be clear about, is that the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. I mean, right out of the gate! How many times is it said? Avenging God, avenging and wrathful, takes vengeance. I guess he's avenging. I guess he takes vengeance. I get that impression. Do you get that impression? I get that impression. And he's jealous. With a perfect jealousy, not a control freak jealousy, not the green eyed monster jealousy, not the checking the wife's odometer when she comes home or reading through all her text messages jealousy. He is passionate, he is zealous about his own glory and about his own people. Oh, how he loves you! He loves you more than you know. Yes, he does. He is absolutely committed to you. And guess what? He expects us to reciprocate. He wants us to be committed to him. Our affections, our loyalty, our allegiance to go back to him. He's not unconcerned about his reputation. He must be glorified. It's right for him to be glorified. He's jealous, zealous, passionate about his glory and about his people. And he is an avenging God. If you look at verse 8 of chapter 1, it says, With an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. You can look at chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will burn your chariots, and the sword shall devour 
your young lions. I will cut off your prey, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. You can look again at chapter 3, verse 5. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord. So let us, let us not miss this. Let us get this. God is not passive or neutral. Oh, it might feel that way. Oh, it might seem that way. Oh, it probably felt that way for the folks in Judah or other neighbors of Nineveh as those years and decades of cruelty ticked by. It probably felt that way for the Hebrews down in Egypt as the centuries went by. It may feel that way for you, but oh, listen, God is not passive or neutral. He does not always get along with everybody. In other words, God does have enemies. Oh, here's your last blanks. There you go. Okay. Still, don't close your Bible yet. Okay. Here are the final blanks for those of you taking notes. God does have enemies whom he will ruin if they will not repent. And, and just in case there's somebody in the room who's thinking, man, this doesn't sound like the God that I know, I would just remind you again of what 2 Peter 3 says. He is not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you remember what a different king of Assyria said about a hundred or more years earlier? What did this other king of Assyria say? Not in Nahum chapter 3, but in Jonah chapter 3. What, what did that king of Assyria say? Well, here's what he said. The word reached the king of Nineveh, Jonah 3, verse 6. The, the word, what word? The word from Jonah, the reluctant prophet, who was sent by God to this wicked city with a message which equaled a loving warning. An opportunity was on the table for them to repent repent, to turn from their evil, to believe in him and be spared. That word, that message, it reached the ears of the king of Nineveh a hundred or so years earlier than what we've got in Nahum 3. And what did the king do? Did he scoff? Did he say, meh, whatever? No. When that word reached his ears, he responded with faith and repentance. It says, he arose from his throne, he removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. These are all outward, external evidences of what was going on inside of his heart in response to the word of God. Verse 7, and he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. He calls for a fast across the kingdom, kingdom-wide, fast, or at least across the city. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn, that's repentance, turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And then comes the question in verse 9 from the lips of a king a good century or so earlier. The question Verse 9, who knows? I love that. Oh, that speaks of humility. Do you see the humility there? This king is not presumptuous. Do you see that there in verse 9? Do you see that? This king is not presumptuous when it comes to his relationship with God at this moment. Because he says, maybe, maybe, perhaps, perhaps, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So what does the king do? He calls for a fast. He calls for his people to repent. In response to the word of God. And he, he's, he's thinking, maybe, maybe, God will turn his wrath away from our city. Maybe God will relent if we will repent. And what did God do? 
Did God destroy Nineveh? Is that what happened? No. That's right. Verse 10. When God saw what they did, he saw that faith mixed with repentance. He saw that happening in that city from the king all the way down, how they turned from their evil way. God relented. No fire fell. (laughs) No angel came and destroyed. No army invaded. Hmm. He relented, yes he did, of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Oh. Back to Nahum 3. You don't serve anybody well. I don't serve anybody well. If I pretend, hear me, if I pretend that the Lord is pleased with people whom he is not pleased with, I know it looks like love and it sounds like love to embrace people who are committed to a sinful lifestyle and say, hey, God loves you. God accepts you just the way you are. I don't care what you're doing with whoever you're doing it with. I love you. God loves you. You are accepted. God is pleased with you. When God, in essence, would look at those people who are locked into their sin, who are absolutely committed to their evil, and say to them, I do not accept you. I am against you. But that same God would also say, I will forgive you. I will pardon you. I will accept you if you will accept my son. If you will see your sin as sinful and you will turn and believe. Believe in my son. Trust in my son. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. It's not helpful to tell people that God accepts them when he's actually angry with them. That's not helpful. That's not helpful. We want doctors who tell us the truth. How am I doing, doc? How'd that test turn out? You see anything that I should be concerned about? I'm sure doctors don't like telling patients bad news. But it's the right thing to do out of love for those whom they care for. Doctors have to tell the truth. And so do we. Yes, with humility and all the compassion that God can pour into our hearts. But we have to tell people the truth. God does get angry. We have to warn them of God's wrath against them because of their sin against him. And it's it's real. And we have to urge them to take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ while they still can. The Lord is not to be ignored. It's an utterly foolish thing for you or me to live like God isn't there. What a foolish way to live our lives. Get up in the morning, do our thing, go to bed at night, and essentially, practically live like God's not even there. It's called denying your creature status. It's called being ungrateful. Because all the blessings that came your way in just one 12-hour hour, hour period ultimately find their way back to him. We live in his world. This is his world. We're on borrowed time. It's utterly foolish to live otherwise. And it's also wrong to think that God does not know or not care or that he's powerless to act. His patience should never be confused as passivity or permissiveness. I was at a gas station on Friday nights buying energy drinks. I will turn that receipt in, honey. They were only 99 cents. And uh, I was waiting in line behind a young man, must have been at least 18, because he told the guy behind the counter, behind the plexiglass, that he he wasn't really sure what he was going to do. He was going to blank, he was explicative. And he might go to the club. Oh, what club is that? I only know of one club in Carroll, Iowa, that young men would frequent. And maybe that man went to the club on Friday night. Who knows what that man did Friday night? And he went to bed and he got up Saturday morning and maybe he did it all over again. That man would be a fool to think because God allowed him to go his own way 
and do his own thing, God must not care. God's, 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 you know, he just, he's just the old man upstairs nodding and winking and, you know, it's all right. You know, kids will be kids. Men will be men. No, not at all. God's not passive and he certainly is not permissive. Oh, but he's patient. He's patient. And he's not just patient with his enemies, he's patient with you. And aren't we thankful? He will move, he will avenge, he will make sure that justice is served. It's a delusion, it's wishful thinking to think otherwise. And this is why we treasure, this is why we treasure Nahum 1 verse 7. This is why we treasure Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. That the Lord is good, a stronghold, a refuge in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. We treasure that verse. As sinners who deserve his wrath, who once were his adversaries, once were his enemies, but have now been reconciled to him, restored to him through the cross of Christ and his resurrection by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We treasure that verse. And we tell others what we find there. We don't keep it to ourselves. We share it. We all need a refuge. And we have one. He's the Lord. He's specifically the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we can sing, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. What you got for sale? What you advertising? I'll, I'll take Jesus over that. Because he's my refuge. See your refuge? See your refuge? Your safe place? From the wrath that you deserve from him because of your sin against him? Be your refuge? Do you treasure him? Do you treasure him? Are you ready to tell somebody else about him? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for both the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum. Help us to take away from these books what your spirit wants us to take away. Thank you for the mercy and grace that you've shown to us. Thank you for those of us who have heard the good news about Jesus and believed it. By your grace, we have repented. We have turned from our sin. We have trusted in Christ and you have relented of your wrath. We've found refuge in your son. And we would treasure him. We would treasure him. We would value him, esteem him highly. And yes, we would be happy to tell somebody else about him. Help us, please. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.